All right, brothers, we want to say, greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, <clears throat> we thank you all for being here today. And uh, we look forward to sharing with you the things that the Lord have laid on our hearts to share. We thank God for this day, for allowing us to see it. Of course, we thank the warden for allowing us to come in and uh, the chaplain as well for allowing us to come in to speak to you all uh, just concerning the things of God. Um, I want to go ahead and mention up front at the beginning of this that uh, if anyone is interested in getting baptized, uh, just let us know. Raise your hand if you're interested in getting baptized. All right. So uh, hopefully at the beginning of next month, we'll ha have a baptism for anyone that's interested in getting baptized. All right. So if you have your Bibles now. Let's go to the third chapter of the book of Proverbs. The third chapter of the book of Proverbs. My prayers are that you all are blessed today and that uh, you can, uh, that you all will be blessed by what you hear in the message today. The third chapter of the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to, I'm going to start reading at verse 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall do what? What shall he do? Now that is a promise of God for us as believers. If we will acknowledge him in all of our ways, uh, he will direct our path. That's a promise from him, for, from him to us. Now, the question that we ask is how many ways, how many of our ways are we acknowledging him in? Um, so look at what that says again in verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So when you think about when you hear that word ways, Think about this term, areas. How many areas in your life have you submitted to God for him to direct your path in? See, that's what it's talking about, areas. How many areas in your life have you submitted to God? Uh, and I just use this as an example for myself. When I, I was 20 years old when I first got married. I'm uh, 49 now. So I was 20 years old when I first got married, when I got married to my first wife. And I did not inquire of the Lord about it. I did not even know that that was something that you should pray about, who you're going to marry. Never, never, as far as I can remember, I never heard a message on praying about who you should be married to. Just never. So it never crossed my mind. So uh, I met a young lady and her, her uh, sister and her sister set us up and we started talking and eventually we got married. And then, of course, uh, 13 years later, the marriage ended. And after the marriage ended, I was no longer interested in marriage. I just thought, well, I'll just serve the Lord. If it's got to go that way, I'll just serve the Lord and uh, I just won't get married. I'll just serve the Lord and be a eunuch for the rest of my life. And then um, there was a young man who had flew down from the Midwest somewhere. At that time, I was living in Louisiana. He had flew down from the Midwest, him and his uh, wife, for me to pray for him. And i just give you the backstory on that. He had... Um, uh, he was possessed. He had, uh, his wife had called, and uh, him and his wife had called, and they had asked if they could come to Louisiana for me to pray for them. And I asked him, how did you, uh, what's going on? And he said that um, he went to visit his grandfather, and uh, that's all he remembered, going to visit his grandfather. And the next thing he knew, he was in jail. When he come to himself, he was in jail, and he didn't know why. And uh, make a long story short, he had uh, supposedly had jumped his grandfather had, to fight his grandfather. And they, of course, he loved his grandfather, uh, but they uh, uh, charged him with attempted murder. He didn't, but he was not aware of what he was doing. And so uh, he made bail, he went to his church, um, and his church told him, well, we don't deliver people here. said, uh, it's a man down in Louisiana we know of, he can deliver you. So... Him and his wife had flew down 
uh, for me to pray for him and deliver him. And uh, later on, uh, his wife called me and told me that he was doing okay, uh, doing very well. It wasn't having any more of those episodes. And that uh, she also said, you know, the Lord told me, I feel like the Lord told me to tell you that he has a wife for you. And uh, if she wasn't a stranger, <laughs> I might have gave her a piece of my mind because I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to hear nothing about a wife. I'd already had one. It didn't work out. I wasn't interested at all in having another wife. And so she said, I, I know it's, it may seem strange to you, she said, but uh, I really believe the Lord told me to tell you that, that he has a wife for you. And so talking with a couple other people, um, they said the same thing, just out of the blue. I believe the Lord is telling me to tell you that he has a wife for you. And uh, I, again, I was fresh out of that marriage. I, I didn't want to hear anything about another wife. And so now I, my prayers are that this will help you. I, when it was three different people up at that point that had told me that, I got on my knees and, uh, you know, I couldn't ignore it because these three people didn't know each other. I got on my knees in, the, in, in my bedroom and I prayed and I asked the Lord, Lord, if, if it's really you, if you really do have a wife for me, I said, well, uh, I gave him two signs. I said, let her be the only woman that give to my ministry. Let her be the first woman that actually give to the ministry. Number two, mark her with my last name. Now, I thought that last one was going to be a pretty tough one. Mark her with my last name. In other words, let her already have my last name. And so a few years later, I, uh, of course, I, I'm real big on family research real big on family research. And uh, so I was doing family research with my last name, Bolden. And, and one day I got a message in that app uh, from a young lady. And uh, she said, uh, uh, I see that you're a, a Bolden and uh, that you're from Louisiana. I said, yeah. And uh, she said, well, let's see how our family match up. So we compared our family trees and I could, I could trace my family all the way back to the 1790s. And uh, we couldn't find each other on family tree. I said, so it looked like we're not kin. She said, okay, well, thank you. And I said, uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's, uh, she said, well, let's, let's, trade, let's trade numbers just in case, you know, maybe you'll run across some people that you can refer to me and vice versa. You know, if I run across some people from your tree, your side of the tree, I'll refer them to you. I said, okay, that's fine. So that was in October of, uh, that was in October of 2009. And uh, so that was it. Hadn't heard from her or anything like that. I just went on with life. And then on December 31st, I got a phone call. I'm looking at my phone ring, and uh, I'm thinking that it's my younger sister. Because my younger sister, she sometimes would just, you know, she would get a new number every year, every other year, or something like that. And I just thought it was her. And I thought, well, I'll just talk to her later when, I, you know, when I'm up or whatever. But something told me to answer the phone. So I answered the phone, and it was this lady who, I, who we got in touch with each other back in October. And so she said, I was just calling you to see how you were doing. I said, oh, well, I'm doing fine. And so we talked for hours and hours. And uh, <laughs> so we keep talking, and I'm telling her about this young lady that's interested in dating me. And about a week later, we're on the phone, and I'm telling her, I said, this is, yes, a long young lady that want to date me, but I'm not interested. She's too young for me. I said, I don't like dating people that's younger than me. You know, my ex-wife was seven years older than me. And all of a sudden, I hear this sniffling, and it's crying. I said, what you crying about? She said, because I'm interested in you. She said, I don't want, you know, I don't want to hear you talk about some other lady that's this. <laughs> and so uh, that, was in, that was January 7th of, two, of the year 2010. And uh, no, January, January 8th of 2010. And we were married that same year, May 8th, 2010. And so, you know, of course, uh, we are just married. You know how it is when you first get married and you're not having lived together. You, you're trying to iron some things out, you know. And who's going to sleep on what side of the bed, all of that. You know, all that little knick-knack stuff that you can argue about if you choose to. And, uh, you know, at some point I just decided, well, you know, maybe this was a mistake. I, you know, I didn't get married. I don't want to have no more arguments. I didn't get married to argue. I don't, you know, don't want to argue. And right when I'm thinking I'm going to back out, the Lord reminded me. You remember that prayer you prayed? 
I said, what prayer? I said, I had a lady to call you and tell you that I had a wife for you, and you got on your knees and you prayed to mark, if I do have a wife, mark her with your last name, and that's what I did. Now, and it just so happened her maiden name was my last name as well, see? So I couldn't back out of that one. <laughs> I couldn't back out, and so, of course, we're still married today. And by the way, she has uh, several other siblings, and she's the only one with the last name Bolden. The only one of her siblings. Now, and I, and I just want to share this. Now, in me sharing that, can you see how before we were born, the Lord knew that that prayer would get prayed, and then he answered that prayer before it was prayed. She didn't change her name. She didn't wait until we got married to change her name. She was born a Bolden, if that make any sense. And so you see how the Lord worked there using that in that instant. So why am I, why am I saying that? Marriage was an area that I did not know that the Lord wanted you to submit to him in. I just thought before then, you find a nice girl, you like her, she like you, y'all see how far it goes. If you feel like it can go to the point of you wanting to spend the rest of your life with her, then you get married. That's what I thought. And so now what I, what I teach is for people to pray before you get married. Ask the Lord whether or not that person is your wife. Because sometimes it may not be. And sometimes you find out, you know, later on down the road, you know, you, you'll be fighting or trying to hold on to something the Lord is trying to rip away from you for something better, you see. Uh, when, when these people was telling me that the Lord had another wife for me, I, was, I didn't want to hear that because I wasn't over the previous one just yet, you see. So I, that wasn't something that I wanted to hear. And, you know, and so it was just a blessing to me, you know, and it's one of those things, you, you know, you, you love who you love. And uh, <laughs> it, it really takes faith to let go of what the Lord didn't have for you, for you to grab a hold of what God does have for you. And so this is one of those areas that I, I didn't know to submit to. I didn't know I could pray. I didn't know the Lord cared about who I was married to. I just thought, well, you marry somebody that's in the faith, that's living for the Lord, and you marry somebody that loves you, and you love them, and you, you get with them, and you, marry, you get married, and you try to make it work, you see. And, and I'll say, my wife and I, we've had plenty of uh, battles. We've had plenty, of, and when I say battles, I don't mean necessarily against each other. I mean together in life. And, and I can say there is nothing like knowing that the person you're married to is with you for the long haul, not having to worry, especially if God is the one that sent them, not having to worry whether or not they're going to bail out on you later on in life. You see, my wife, when we, uh, I just use this as an example, my, my ex-wife, uh, I got sick in 1997, and uh, I mean gravely sick. I didn't know what was wrong. I just knew something was wrong because I could not, I lost all my strength. I couldn't I couldn't uh, move. Uh, she, I was uh, in school and working at the same time, and she was working as well. And I would, um, when she would go to work, she would help me get down on the floor. And so I'd lay on the floor until she got home. And she would fix my food and put it on the plate and put the plate right there by my head. And that's how I'd eat my food, like a dog. So that's how weak I, that's how bad off I was. And, uh, at some point, uh, <laughs> she was, she, we had a little girl that wasn't a year old yet, and she was pregnant with our sec second daughter. And uh, at some point, she said, you know, I, I, can't, I can't deal with this. So she bought a plane ticket for her and my daughter, and uh, they were going to fly back and move to, back to California, where she was from. And so I told her, I said, well, since you bought your plane ticket, I said, well, look like I'm a, I can't be in this house by myself. I said, I can't take care of myself, so uh, call the uh, ambulance and uh, get them to come out. And so uh, they came out, and they said, we don't know what's wrong, but you're gravely sick. And so they, they took me on to the hospital, and she eventually showed up there at the emergency room, and the doctor came in and said, uh, when they ran all kind of tests, the doctor said, well, Mr. Bolden, we don't know what's wrong. said, but uh, you, if you'd have waited one more day, you wouldn't have been here. You know, you, if you'd have waited one more day, you wouldn't have been here. And so when my ex-wife heard that, she apologized. She said, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were that sick. I said, well, I don't know what you think sick is. <laughs> but when I get to the point where I can't feed myself, I'm in trouble, see? And so, uh, you, you know, you take note of those types of things. And so then fast forward, we divorced. 
my new wife, that, you know, that I'm married to now, uh, when I got sick, I went in the hospital, and they had me in a, 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 the, a, a part of the hospital where uh, nobody's allowed except for the spouse, and then even they have to go home. But when they put me in that part of the hospital, my wife said, I'm not, I'm not leaving him. She said, I'm not leaving him. And she said, if I, if, if, if I can't stay with him, I'm taking him with me, and we'll go to another hospital. She said, but I'm not leaving my husband in here with you all. I'm, I'm, I'm going to watch over him. And so you know how it is when they have you medicated, and, you know, they constantly coming in the room, and you're tired, and you're just trying to sleep. So she was up pretty much the whole time. They would come in. She said, hey, what's that, what's that you're giving him? What's that, you, what's that medicine? What you about to put in his IV? And they tell her, she'd write it down. She'd say, hold on, let me research this, see what the side effects are. So she was doing all of that. And then because it was a room that, you know, the part of the hospital where they don't allow visitors, you know, uh, to, to stay, they didn't have a bed there. They didn't have a sofa or a chair for her to sit in. So she just, she made her pallet on the floor, and that's where she slept. I think I was in there for about a week or so. She slept on the floor the whole time, you see. So that's the difference now between a, a, a wife <laughs> that God didn't send versus a wife that God did send. They're going to be there for you. And so that is the um, guarantee that we have whenever we submit every area of our lives to God. He will direct us and it will always work out better than what it would have had we just made our own decisions and our own choices in life, you see. So look at what that says there. Let's read that again. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Everybody see that? So when, after my first marriage ended, I, I, didn't, I didn't trust anybody in that area. I didn't want to give that area to anybody. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't, I, I just didn't have any trust in that area. But this tells us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not unto our own understanding. Now let me explain now. A lot of times, our understanding is affected by our experiences. See, my understanding was I don't want to get remarried. Well, why was that my understanding? Why was that my conclusion for my life? Well, it was because of my past experience. You see, I, I've been married to a woman for 13 years. We got four children, and she could still up and leave. So how can you trust anybody? How can you trust? How, how, why would I want to dive deep into that again? If, you know, you, you figure if you're married five years, you're going to be married 50, you know. But so why would I want to get involved in that again? No, I don't want to get, no, I don't want to get married. See, that was my understanding. But it was based on my experience and my hurt, my disappointments. And so this is letting us, basically letting us know not to lean to our own understanding. In other words, don't lean on your past experiences. You can't take this experience, that experience, that experience, and then some kind of way put it all together in your own wisdom and still think that it's going to be the will of God for your life. Sometimes that's not the way it works. Most of the time that's not the way it works. Sometimes God will just blindside you with something that his will that you had no, no idea was his particular will. You see, and sometimes his will is right in front of you, and you're overlooking it all the time, you see. Like the old people used to say, can't see the forest for the trees, you see. And so look at what that said, verse 6. In all thy ways, do what? Acknowledge him. In all of our ways, acknowledge him. And then what will he do? Everybody see that? Now, <laughs> it's a blessing to live a life where the Lord is directing you. I really believe that the Lord will direct anybody that belongs to him. The question is, how do we know how God is directing us? See, sometimes we look for direction in one way, and then it comes another way. Sometimes we're... we're, we're Sometimes we can box God in concerning how he directs us. I'm a, I'm a, we're going to go over four ways the Lord directs. He directs us through unctions. Everybody know what an unction is? It's a feeling that you have, like, a, like a, a feeling that you have. So he'll direct us through that. He will direct us through circumstances. In other words, if this door don't open 
then that's God's way of showing me, try the next door. Everybody see now? So through circumstances, this didn't work out. This door is not opening up for me. I don't have peace about this. So this circumstance, this is a circumstance that's meant to help me go through this door, you see. So a lot of times God directs us through circumstances, you see. Also, uh, another way, the most common way is uh, through people. Um, and through his audible voice. In, actual, in, in other words, we can actually hear the voice of God talking to us. Sometimes it's through our ears. Sometimes it's in our spirit, man. So let's go look at an example of that real briefly. Let's go to the third chapter of the book of 1 Samuel. And we hope before the night is over with that you all will have a, a better understanding of how God directs his people. He promises us if we will acknowledge him in all of our ways, he will actually direct us. So let's, my prayer is that we will have an understanding of that, of how the Lord directs us, the, just the different ways that he does it. And we're going to use some personal examples to uh, help you to see those things. All right. The third chapter of the book of First Samuel. And we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, and the child Samuel, now, so let me give you a little background. So y'all know the story of Samuel. His mother, Hannah, was barren with children. She could not have a child. And at some point she prayed to the Lord and asked the Lord, if, Lord, if you will give me a child, I'll give him back to you. And so then the Lord opened up her womb and she got pregnant. And she had the child. And when the Bible says when after she weaned the child, she brought the child to the temple uh, to Eli, who was the high priest at that time. And so from a child, from a little child, uh, uh, Samuel was living with Eli. He wasn't even living with his parents. He was living with Eli, the high priest of God at that time. And so here we find him as a child. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. That word open means frequent. In other words, the Lord was not given frequent visions. At that time, it says, and it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. In other words, before before the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and laid down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place and the Lord came and stood and called as other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, speak for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth shall tingle. So I, I, we won't go any further than that. I, I just want to show this point that Samuel as a child he was hearing a voice call him, but he was not aware that at that time that God talked to people that way. He was, the Bible says he did not. The Lord hadn't spoke through him yet as, as a minister and things like that, basically is what that means. So when he heard an audible voice calling his name, there's only one other person in there with him. And so he takes off running. Hey, Eli, here I am. 
Eli said, no, I didn't, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down. So he went and laid down, and the Lord came. And the Bible says, if you, you read the third time, the Lord says, the Bible, or the fourth time, the Lord went and was standing there in the door, basically, calling him. And there was Eli running right past the Lord, going to Eli. Uh, Samuel running right past the Lord, going to Eli, because he couldn't see the Lord. And so there he was as a child, not knowing the voice of God, just knowing that there was a voice that was calling him. And, and there he was passing by it the whole time, going to the, to the man of God at that time, Eli. And Eli had to tell him, no, that wasn't me. And the third time, Eli said, look, perceive, look, if that's the Lord calling you. If he call you again, says, uh, speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. And when he said that, then the Lord began to talk to him. Uh, and give him what he wanted him to see. So I wanted to show you uh, sometimes we hear an audible voice. Sometimes. Sometimes we hear an audible voice. I'm, I'm going to come back to that audible voice. Audible, yes. Like, uh, like the same way you hear my voice. The same way you hear my voice, sometimes God will speak to you that, that way. Uh, so the first, the first thing we mentioned was unctions, right? Uh, and I want to just, uh, share something. I want to share a story with you all. Now, you may wonder why do I share stories the way that I share them? Um, of course, we, we use the Bible and we talk about the Bible and we show you stories in the Bible. But I also do that to help you to understand that God is still God today, Amen. that he's still talking to people, he's still dealing with people, and he wants to have a personal relationship with each and every one of you. And so we share those stories to help you to see that, that, that God is a personal God. You know, and he died for you personally, and so he intend on having a personal relationship with you. So the first thing we're going to cover is unctions. That sometimes the Lord gives us unctions, and sometimes we may not understand it, and oftentimes we will disobey those unctions just because we don't understand why the unction is even coming up. Some years ago, uh, when I was in college, I was in college to be an engineer. Uh, this isn't something that I've shared very often, but my first, the first major that I picked, the area that I chose to be an engineer in was in aeronautics with airplanes. Uh, I was going to be an avionics engineer. In other words, I was going to help design systems and things like that and fix those avionics systems. And so for the first, I would say I, maybe for about the first year of my schooling, that's, that's, that's what I was in, was avionics engineering. And then just all of a sudden, I show up to school one morning, and I just had a, a, just a thought, just a brief thought, change of change a major from avionics to broadcast. So that's what I did. I just, I walked to the office. I told him, I, you know, I, is, it, is it possible for me to change my major? I said, yeah, you, you paying for the college so you can change whatever you want to change to. I said, well, I, I want to change it to broadcast. Can y'all switch me over to that and, get, you know, take me out of the class I'm in now, put me in? They said, yeah, we could do that. And so that's what I did, you know. And so they, they switched me over and that's, that's what I had gotten a, a degree in. And so, so that, that was an unction. Didn't know why I had that unction. Didn't know what it was about that. So when I graduated, uh, several of my friends uh, that got an, a job, and now we're moving into circumstances. Several of my friends had gotten a job at working at WorldCom. How many of you remember WorldCom? That, how many of you remember when it was a, the long-distance companies? You had Sprint, MCI. Uh, WorldCom, those, you know, when you had to have long distance on top of your phone, you know, on top of your phone, but it wasn't just included. You had to pay for long distance. And so, I tell you what, that was a scam, wasn't it? <laughs> and so, a lot of my friends, they had gotten a job working at WorldCom. And uh, so that's what I wanted. I wanted the job. I, you know, I saw the amount of money that they were making, and they were some of them. When they got the job, they went out and got a, 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 a mortgage, and they bought a new house, and they riding around in nice, uh, nice vehicles and things. I'm thinking, man, my my 
main goal in life at that time, because I had a wife and, and by this time, two daughters. And so my main goal in life was to make enough money for them to be comfortable. I wanted my, I didn't want my wife or my two daughters to, to, to want for anything. So that was my main goal, make enough money to be comfortable where they don't have to worry about a thing. And so in my mind, that's what I'm going to do. So, you know, a friend of mine, he's already working for them. And uh, he said, uh, he set it up and put in a good word for me. And uh, he said, you know, he set up for where I can come in for an interview. Now, these interviews at these particular companies, uh, when you went in, you had to be there all day. It wasn't just an interview where you go in for a few minutes. They ask you what you want, you know, what you think you can give, do for this company, whatever. It was a whole day. You had to spend a whole day at the company, and it was three or four different people that you were spending the day with throughout the day. So I'm going to, you know, in this interview, and they all telling me, yeah, well, you, we, you know, you, you seem like a good fit for us. And it was a major, a multi-billion dollar company. You know, and they paid really, really well, really, really well. And so um, they basically let me know, you, we think you'll get the job. We think you'll get the job. You know, don't worry about it. So I, I left the interview that day and went home, and I just prayed. Now, I'm going to say this. I prayed very, very, very hard. I don't know, you know, I mean, I prayed up until that point. I don't know if I'd ever prayed that hard before. God, please give me this job. God, please give me this job. Lord, please give me this job. And I was getting kind of worried because they weren't calling. So then, I, you know, I had all of them's personal number. You know, they, they numbers at the office there. Everybody I had interviewed with. And I was calling them, hey, did you give me a, you sure you gave me? Yeah, we gave you a good, okay, well, what's, what's taking y'all so long? You know, I was, you know, <laughs> I was wanting that job. And my thought was, you know, it, it, maybe it, me calling them, well, make them know I really want this job. You know, I got a wife and children to feed, so don't turn me down. And I'm telling you, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And uh, a few days later, finally the call came through. I couldn't answer that phone fast enough. The man, it was a man on the phone. I said, this, John, this John Bowden? I said, yes, sir, this is he. He said, I'm calling you to make you an offer. And he said, uh, when you, if you accept this offer on the phone, this is... This is your contract. You know, we're recording this call, and once you accept the offer, you're locked in. They say, we're calling you to offer you, offer you this particular job for this amount of money uh, every month. Will you do, uh, and this is your salary for the year. Do you accept it? I said, yes, sir, I sure do. I sure do. Me and the Lord, we both accept it. <laughs> they said, all right, all right, we'll... Uh, We'll call you back when we're ready for you to come in and sign the paperwork. And I said, yes, sir, I'll be waiting on that call. So I was so excited, so, so excited. I'm just jumping around, just really excited. Thank you, Lord, for coming through. The next day, I got a call from the same man. Is this Mr. Bolden? Yes, sir, this is. Are y'all ready for me to come in and sign them? No, we're not. We can't. Said, uh, you're too, you're overqualified for the position that we offer. I said, I don't mind. I, I don't, I don't mind being overqualified. If I'm overqualified, that means I could do whatever y'all. So I don't mind being. That. So they said, No, we can't, we can't, we can't let you take this job. You're overqualified. Do y'all have anything? No, we don't have anything else. Sorry. And I'm telling you, it just felt like all the air left the room. I was so, and I, I'm t- I didn't know what else to do but to pray. I was disappointed, and I was letting the Lord have it. Why did you let me pray and then get those people to call me and tell me I had a job, and then only the, the, for them to call back the very next day and tell me I did not have it? Why? Why are you playing these guys? I felt like the Lord was playing games. Why? You would you, you to come out better just not let them even call me with the job. Why you get me all hyped up like that? And then the next day, take it from me. You know what the Lord said? He said, I gave you that job to let you know that I, I heard your prayer. He said, but I took it because that's not my perfect will for you. Just that, just that simple. I gave you the job because I wanted you to know that I heard your prayer. But I took it from you because that's not my perfect will. So, okay, Lord. 
Okay, Lord. What is your perfect will? He said, apply for Channel 8. Apply at that job. I applied. When I got off my knees, I applied for that job. And a week later, they called me, and I got the job at Channel 8. So you see how the Lord used circumstances. He closed the door here and opened a door there. In other words, I wasn't, I, it wasn't meant for me to go through this door. Now, I didn't know why. Now, here's, here's the wisdom of God. When I first started working at Channel 8, I wasn't making as much money as what I would have made had I been working at WorldCom. But guess what? About a year later, WorldCom went bankrupt. And there were people who had banked on that income. Again, I, like I said earlier, some of my friends got mortgages, went out and bought new cars with their newfound wealth, only to have to file for bankruptcy, only to have to take jobs at McDonald's and, thing, and places like that to try to make ends meet. None of them stayed afloat. They all eventually moved somewhere else because of their job. They lost their homes. You see what the Lord was trying to save me from? See, all I could see was right up front. This is so much money an hour. This is good money. And the Lord was saying, yeah, but you don't see what's coming down the pike. I see it. They're about to go bankrupt. And they're about to lay everybody off. Staggered, you see. And because of that, I'm saving you from that. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you know that, that the Lord will sometimes save you from, seeing, from things you don't even see. You, you, you might be disappointed now, but you just keep living, and you'll see exactly what the Lord was saving you from. Does everybody see that? So that was something that I, I you know, that was a hard lesson <laughs> to, to learn. And so from that, I vowed, okay, Lord, from now on, I'm going to just see what your will is. Because, see, I got myself out there with, with WorldCom. But the Lord, in his grace and mercy, he stopped me from doing that. Now, to, to make a long story short with that, as I b kept working at Channel 8, I kept getting promoted, kept getting promoted, kept getting promoted. And eventually, I made the money that I would have made at WorldCom. You see the goodness of God there. The Lord was saving me from myself. He was saving me from my own will. You see that? So how did he direct my path in that situation? Through circumstances. I'm going to hire you, let them hire you, then I'm going to fire you. So why, why would the Lord do that? Why would he, why would he do that? Why would he say, I, I let them hire you because I wanted you to know that I was hearing your prayer? I'm going to tell you something. Why? Because he knows deep down on the inside, I would have been very, very disappointed if I hadn't got the job. If I, I could have felt like, Lord, I put in all this prayer time. I've been praying fervently only for you not to hear me so the lord to save me from that you know my disappointment in that and, and the lord not hearing from me uh not hearing me he he let me know i heard you i gave it to you to let you know i heard you see how he spoke to me now that was his speaking to me i'm giving you the job to let you know that i heard you but i took the job because it's not my perfect will for you so you see sometimes god you know, that, and this is one of the most important ones. So many people get offended with God because they're not getting their way in something, because they're disappointed, when really all it is is God directing your path. God directs our paths through circumstances. You might hear a no here, a no here, a no here, but at some point you're going to hear a yes. And then you know this is God. Okay, this is God. This is what God wants me to do. So through circumstances. Uh, the next one is through people. God will speak through people. Uh, when, I had, when I was just about to get out of prison, I was in California. I was in a, what they call a Navy brig. Uh, the chaplain there, uh, uh, I was preaching in that prison. And the, uh, my last meeting with the chaplain, he had called me to his office, called me to his office. And uh, he said, so... Uh, John, what do you plan on doing when you leave here? I said, uh, I, I think I'm going I'm to just go home to my hometown. I said, I got a, a mother and my stepfather that live there. I said, they're getting up there in age. And I think I'm going to just take me a little job and take care of them, you know, to take care of them in their old age. 
And uh, he looked at me with the biggest concern. And he said, I, I don't think, I don't think uh, that's God's will for you. He said, uh, now, and I just want to share this. Uh, when I was in prison, I was always hearing this, and maybe some of you have heard it. You know, when you get out, don't expect much out of life. You know, that's what I was told. Your record's going to follow you. And it's going to follow you, so don't expect much. Just, just be glad you'll be able to make a living wherever somebody opened up a door at. That's what I was told. And so that's, that's what I banked on. That was my mindset. Okay, well, I'm going to just, okay, I'm not going to expect much. I just get out and uh, uh, just work a job and just live life, you know, just do what I can. But that chaplain, him, I'm sitting across from his desk. He said, no. He said, I don't, don't accept that. He said, uh, don't even get used to wh- where you're going. I said, my hometown. He said, don't, don't get used to living there. He said, I don't believe the Lord is going to let you stay there. He said, uh, the way the Lord used you in this place, I believe the Lord's got something much bigger than you, and you need to expect that. And, and that's what I want to share with you, brothers. This, this is not the end of your life here, you see. That uh, don't allow your present circumstances uh, to dictate what, how God want to use you, you see. Is, is not, not the end. Does everybody understand it now? Yes, and so that's what I had accepted. And so I, 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 I went home and I kept that in the back of my mind. And uh, one day uh, I'm applying for jobs and I can't get a job. Just, just can't get a job. And uh, so one, one, one morning, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm up watching TV and uh, a commercial comes on. And uh, it's a commercial for, uh, for the engineering school that I just got finished telling you about. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And when the commercial went off, the Lord said, now you go there. You go there. And uh, so my wife at the time, when she woke up from in the morning, I said, the Lord told me we're, gonna, we're supposed to move to Tulsa. And uh, she said, okay. And, of course, you, I think I shared the story with you all we, uh, before we... Uh, <laughs> We packed up our car, uh, and we, that's the, pretty much all the stuff we had could fit in the, in the trunk of the car in the back seat. And uh, we left Louisiana with $45 in our pockets. And uh, we put about $37 worth of gas in there to get from, from Louisiana to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, so when we got to Tulsa, we had $7 left, or uh, $8 left. And then we use that <laughs> we use that to go get something to eat, and I was just determined, you know, we just gonna we just we just sleep in the car. I'm getting enrolled in school and everything. We just we just sleep in the car if we got to. Uh, but you know, before the day was over, it was a man come up to me and he gave me a, 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 a six hundred dollar check that I didn't know, and uh, he said, I feel like I feel led to get this to you. He gave me a check, and I went and took that check and I paid first and last month's rent at an apartment complex. So you see how now if if this chaplain had not spoke that to me uh, in his voice, I would have I'd have just I would have limited myself w- with what God wanted to do. See, I would have I wouldn't have, I wasn't thinking anything. Just I'm gonna go home, take care of my parents, and I just live. You know, just live, just a quiet life. But the Lord would say, No, you're not. It's not gonna be a quiet life. <laughs> you're gonna do what I tell you to do. And, and don't go by what mankind, don't go by what man tell you concerning you being limited. I'm God. And if I open up a door, who's going to close it? You see? So I, I thank God for that chaplain, for him speaking that to me, for him just letting the Lord use him to tell me that there was something bigger for me than what I could see. And, that, and, I, and I sincerely believe that's the case for every individ, individual that surrendered their life to the Lord. The Lord is always thinking bigger of us than we're thinking of ourselves. Always. Always thinking way above. Let's think about Saul, how he persecuted the church. Who would have ever thought he'd have been responsible for two-thirds of the New Testament that we read today? A man that was throwing prisoner people in in prison men and women throwing them in jail like it's nothing just because they were calling on the name Jesus and there was God took him and made him something completely different than what he started off with and you know God gets glory in that God gets glory in taking what society may have turned their backs on 
and making them something that the society and and the whole look at what look at what uh, the Pharisees were saying about the Lord's disciples there. These are unlearned men. Where are they getting this doctrine? How are they able to do these things and they're unlearned? And you know, <laughs> me personally, I prefer to stay unlearned. I prefer to stay a fool to the world so that God can use me for his glory. Amen. So God uses people uh, sometimes to steer us how he want us. You know, it's just a matter of hearing, you know, especially some of you may have experienced that somebody that may not necessarily know you personally can come and speak something to you. And, you know, this was this was the Lord. This person don't know this is going on. And you could know that it was the Lord. You see that. So it's important for us to pay attention. See, I sincerely believe that God is always directing people. But the question is, are, the, are his people paying attention to that direction? Do we see these things that we're calling out today, that we're talking about today? Do we see that as the direction of God, you see? Sometimes we can be praying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, how do you want me to handle it? And you know, the Lord have already spoken. Nine times out of ten, God has already spoken. It's just that we were not paying attention. We, why? Because we expect him to come one way and he comes another way, you see? And so we have to be looking for God in any area, in any way that he chooses to come. We have to be spiritually alert and pay, paying attention so we can know, okay, that was God. One, uh, I was about five years old, and uh, when my daddy's little sister come to pick me up, and uh, her and her daughter to go shopping, they went I don't know, you know, I'm only five, so I don't know what all is going on. The only thing I know is I'm in a store in a city that I don't know about. I know we weren't in our hometown. And uh, so I'm about five. And I, everywhere I'm going, I, we're in a woman's section, and it's got all, all I'm seeing is dresses and skirts and pants and things like that. So, you know, all of these clothes racks are much taller than me. And so I'm following them around, and you know how women do. They looking and checking the tag and pulling this pulling the skirt off or the pants off and putting it up against themselves. Well, you know, it's just me and my, my two relatives there, both of them females. I don't want to, what did you bring me along here for? Why am I here? That was my thinking. So I guess at some point I wandered off. You know, and all I see is all these tall, to me they tall, because I'm only five, all these tall clothes racks. So I just, I wandered off. And before I know it, I'm at the door. And my thinking was, I just go sit in the car. I don't feel like shopping. Don't, you know, I'm on, I don't feel like watching all this go on. You know, and I'm still that way today. You see, that's, that's, that's just how I am. You know, when I go to the store, I know what I'm going there for. That was one of the arguments my wife and I, we would have all the time. I, you know, she'd ask me to go to the store with her. I'd say, do they have a chair there? They got a sofa or something? Well, no, I don't want to go because I know what you do. You, you're going to price check and do all this. I don't, I'm not up for that. I, when I go, before I, and I'm that way today, when I, before I go to Walmart, I'm looking on the app to see what aisle I got to go to, you see, because <laughs> I don't want to, <laughs> I just want to go straight there and get back home. And so, you know, at five years old, that's the way I was. And so my thought was, I'm going to go outside, find her car. She had a little orange uh, VW Bug. How many of you remember them little, them little vehicles? Yeah, that's not hard to spot, you see. So I walked outside. And, my, and it was a mall. And so my guess was, I came out, I went out the wrong door. I didn't see an orange, orange vehicle anywhere. So I just walk. I just keep walking, keep walking. Before I know it, I'm out on the street, and I'm walking down this major highway, down the sidewalk, all these high-rise buildings around me. And I have no idea where I'm going. No idea. All I know is, well, if I keep walking, I guess at some point they'll pass me by, you know, and they'll pick me up. That's what my thinking is. But I know I'm lost. And uh, I guess after maybe 15 to 30 minutes of walking, some man, I'm in, a, again, keep in mind, I'm in a city that I don't know. You know, I know I'm not in my hometown. I know that. And uh, so some man, he drives up behind me and uh, he said, hey, you. Now he's in his car and he let the window down. Hey, you, go in there. Uh, yes, sir. So I was taught when adults talked, you know, I was I was taught as a child. When adults speak to you, you obey. Hey, you go in there. And so that's what I did. I looked, 
where he was pointing at. There was a door. I walked up the steps, walked up a second flight of steps, and went into the building and sat down. And uh, what was it? The police station. And so I, I'm sitting there, and, and the cop, he came, come up to me, he said, who are, you, who are you with? I said, I'm with my, my cousin and aunt and stuff. He said, where are they? I said, they're at the store. What store? I don't know. And, uh, you know, and I guess maybe I looked frightened or something. He went and got me something to drink, a soda or something. And he's sitting there. I remember him smoking and things like that. And he's asking me questions. I say, I don't know what my address is. I don't know what my phone number is. And, you know, a few minutes later, maybe about 15, 20 minutes later, in walks my aunt. You see. <laughs> in this big city, here she comes. Now, how did that man t know to tell me to go in there? How did he even know I was lost? He didn't, he, he didn't know me. But I really believe that was the Lord speaking through him to tell me where to get to safety at. He didn't know what my, what my condition was. But I listened. And so I, I went in there, just like he said. And, and not long after that, my aunt came and got me. You see? So just these strange types of things like that, if we'll pay attention to those types of things, we can see how the Lord is always directed us. How you doing? Uh, my name is uh, Gann. It's Walter Gann. And uh, I was going to give you a little bit of my testimony and stuff. Uh, when I was at work, uh, it's a few years back, uh, it was 2000, it was 2019. My wife kept coming to me and uh, asking me to get saved. My wife was a godly woman, you know, and uh, she's been saved. And I kept pushing it off, you know not wanting to get saved she kept praying about it and praying for me and uh you know are you sure you need to be saved da, 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 this and i was like no you no know, i just kept pushing it aside well november 28 2020 she passed away with covid and uh you know and uh, everything i kept praying to god and you know and stuff like that and i blamed him i kept blaming him for that and then uh may of 2022 my sister passed you know, I lost two of them, you know, two family members. And then uh, I got in trouble. You know, I was drinking, taking pills and stuff, and I got in trouble, and I ended up in jail. Well, two weeks later, I was on the kiosk visiting my niece, and I kept hearing something behind me. And uh, my cell was, like, right behind me. I had two other cellmates and, uh, and everything. And I got off the visitation and walked in there, and uh, one of my – cellmates was on his knees you know praying to god you know asking him you know to come in his heart forgiveness and all that and i just kept listening to him praying every day and i asked him you know how he felt and everything and he said he felt you know really good and he asked me if i knew jesus and i knew him but i, I didn't have him in my heart so i got saved there and started. i've been saved now almost three years so and uh i'm 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 pretty happy you know about that prayer really works and uh, he does listen all the time. You, you pray to him, he will be there, and, and, and he will uh, give you what you want to, you know, you're praying for. I was in uh, HB when I got here, and I kept praying about faith-based pod and kept praying and kept praying. And about a week and a half later, they moved me, you know. And uh, I'm just so happy I got him in my life now, and uh, I'm, just, I'm happy and excited. Oh, uh, uh, no, nah, we was reading out of Proverbs 3 tonight, and it got touched me because I've been going through a lot um, with what to do with, because uh, I'm in a faith-based pod, whether I should stay or not. But I've been, when it said understanding the Lord and acknowledge Him, and He'll show, direct my path, to not really done that because I wasn't going to come to church, and I was fighting with the devil. But when he preached that, it touched me in my heart, and I felt like I just had to speak on it. And that's about all I got to say. <laughs> yes, my name is Daryl Doan. Uh, I've been here at Whiteville about four years. I've been in and out of church my whole life. Uh, I 
have uh, been in and out of trouble my whole life. I never really understood the Lord and what He can do for you up until about a year ago. I kept praying, kept praying. I was strung out on drugs. And December of this year, He came to me and said, Don, I'm going to deliver you from that. Well, I used to think people were crazy when they said God talks to them. But ever since December 31st, I have been sober. I flatten out at about June. Well, tonight, as I walked in here, I was reading Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And then he came in and he... Uh, preached on it and said trust in the Lord with all the heart and lean not on thy own understanding in all the ways acknowledge him and he shall direct the path if I can tell y'all anything God is real and he can deliver you from anything at any time if you'll just lean on him and trust in him uh to all the kids out there, I hope that if y'all are going down the wrong path, that y'all have somebody come to you before it's too late and you've wasted 33 years like I did. But I plan on getting out and talking to young youth. Hope to see y'all soon. Well, uh, can you hear me? Well, this afternoon, or actually it was this morning, I went to work. I work in the chapel here at Whiteville. And uh, I was sitting there, and we had a couple people come in, and commissary decided to come around noon today. So I went to go ahead and go get my commissary. Well, I told Miss Gooch to go ahead and grab it for me. So she got it, so I went back to work. Well, I decided to uh, leave work a little bit early so I had time to meet her before she left. So I got my commissary, went back to the pod. Well, during my commissary, when I got it, I realized that I was missing my toothpaste. I ordered my toothpaste, and they gave me, instead of a $4 toothpaste, they gave me a, to a toothpaste, uh, not a toothpaste, but a, a, a toothbrush. It's like 40 cents for a toothbrush. So um, I got upset. I was uh, raising cane. I was telling my slave what was wrong with me because I can't afford it. You know, I don't, I don't get a lot of money. And so um, I was talking to my slave, and I decided to sit there, and I, you know, completely shut down. So I started praying. I said, Lord, I said, uh, you know, I don't have any money. Um, I don't know what to do. I need toothpaste. You know, I'm running low. Um, you know, you took it away for some reason. Just help me, bless me with the toothpaste. Lord, you know my needs, let it be made. And uh, well, after count, after I done prayed about it and everything, I read the word with my celly after count, I came out um, and I started talking to one of my brothers and uh, I told him what happened. Well, he was like, well, let me get the, let me get the toothbrush. So, I was like, what do you mean? He says, just give me the toothbrush. So I give him the toothbrush. He brings me down a toothpaste. Um, and with Pastor Bolton talking just a second ago, stating that uh, the, everything will be delivered in God's time. It's just, it, it's incredible the things that God will do for you, even though it feels like everything's going wrong in your life. Um, and I just thank Pastor Bolton for coming out. He's consistent. He's uh, been here for me. He's always giving me something that I need to hear. And uh, I can't thank him enough. So I appreciate you.